good afternoon to all who have joined online. Uh, can you hear me? Shehan, can you hear me? Shehan? Yes, madam, we can hear you. Right. Yes. Shall we start? Yes. Right. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, right. The, um, let me warmly welcome all of you for this uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, monthly clinical meeting organized in collaboration with the uh, Ceylon College of Physicians. Uh, I'm very grateful to President and the Council of the Ceylon College of Physicians for the cooperation extended in organizing this regular monthly clinical program that we do conduct in collaboration with the professional organizations. So in this time, uh, it would be uh, a, an eminent clinician, that's Dr. Uh, Shehan Silva, who uh, undertook the responsibility of organizing this uh, along with his registrars and senior registrars. So they'll be talking to us on a reminder of a disease in oblivion. Uh, so let me cordially invite the first speaker, Dr. Chanurdi K. Vikramatunga, Registrar in Medicine, University Medical Unit, Colombo South Teaching Hospital, Kalubovila, to make her presentation. That would be a clinical case presentation. Uh, Chamurdi, over to you. Thank you, madam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving us this valuable opportunity to remind you of a disease in oblivion. Our patient was 51 years old, previously well male patient coming with severe neck stiffness for two days duration. It was of insidious onset, which gradually worsened over 24 hours period with inability to open his mouth. There was no history of fever or altered behavior, no history of seizures no other constitutional or systemic symptoms, no past history of psychiatric disorder such as depression or schizophrenia. He was not on any long-term medication. On presentation, he had an abnormal posturing. Here, you can see that the patient is arching backwards while being conscious. And uh, in this photograph, you'll be able to see that the patient is keeping his neck in hyperextended position, which is also known as retrocolis. On further questioning, the patient revealed the past history of nail prick injury, which has happened five days back while he was working. He has gone to a private nursing care unit on the same day of the incident, where he was given tetanus toxoid and prescribed oral coamoxiclovir 625 milligram twice a day for five days duration. But patient has taken antibiotic for one day duration as the wound was minor. On examination, patient was conscious, rational, and he was showing opisthotonus posturing where he kept his body rigid and arched back with his head thrown backwards. Due to this, his neck flexion and rotation was restricted. We were also able to observe trismus due to spasm of jaw muscles causing the mouth to remain tightly closed. Severe nausea rigidity was noticed and blood pressure was 150 by 80 millimeter mercury and pul pulse Rate was 96 beats per minute with good volume and regular rhythm. Lungs were clear with vesicular breathing and saturation was 99% on room air. Abdomen was soft and non-tender, bowel sounds were present. In left lower limb examination, we could inspect that there is a prick injury wound on plantar surface of the foot, but there was no features of cellulitis or abscess formation. Neurological examination, his Glasgow coma scale score was 15 out of 15 and bilateral pupils equal reactive to light, cranial nerves were normal. On limb examination, patient had increased tone in all four limbs and power was normal, hyperreflexia is noted in all four limbs and planters were downward. There was no sensory visit. At this point, our problem sir, the patient is in opistotonous position with trismus. So could he be having tetanus? 
our so depending on the history and examination findings our differential diagnosis is were first differential diagnosis was tetanus with history of nail prick injury and opisthotonus posturing with trismus and our second differential diagnosis was godekandru poisoning or strychnine poisoning due to ingestion of rat poison but patient was not a known patient with depression or didn't have suicidal ideation so exposure was unlikely third differential diagnosis was dystonic reaction following ingestion of drug but since patient was not on any antipsychotic antiemetic or antidepressant drugs we kept this diagnosis lower down in the list uh, as the exposure is unlikely our fourth diagnosis was stiff person syndrome but in the history or on examination we couldn't find any positive feature that will suggest you of autoimmune disorder so kept we kept that diagnosis lower down in the list on admission we ordered full blood count renal function test liver function test crp electrocardiogram and uncontrast ct brain with blood cultures with antibiotic sensitivity but unfortunately anaerobic culture bottles were not available at columbus of teachers hospital on this day so we started him on intravenous antibiotics with supportive measurements we kept him in a calm environment with regular suctioning as antibody we started him on intravenous c penicillin 4 million units for 6 hourly and uh, intravenous metronidazole 500 mg 6 hourly tetanus immunoglobulin 5000 units were given 1500 international units around the wound and 3500 international unit via intramuscular route to the bilateral thighs and arms surgical opinion was taken for his left sore prick injury wound and initially managed with intravenous antibody antibiotics and wide local excision done as surgical icu on the same day of admission prophylactically we started him on subcutaneous inoxaparin 40 mg daily dose for de uh, deep vein thrombosis this patient developed tonic contractions and spasms on the day of the admission while he was at the ward Neurology opinion was taken for the management of this tonic contraction and spasm and treated with intravenous diazepam 10 mg 6 hour. Patient was intubated for airway protection and nasogastric tube insertion was done when the patient was in the ward as we were unable to clear secretions due to trismus. Right after intubation, due to autonomic instability, patient's, develop, patient's blood pressure dropped to 87 by 40 millimeter mercury and he was, he was started on noradrenaline infusion at a rate of 0.2 microgram kg per hour infusion. Because he was having tonic contraction and spasms associated with autonomic instability, he was started on intravenous magnesium sulfate 1.5 gram per hour infusion. On admission, his magnesium level was 0 0.91. These are the in, uh, investigation results on the day, admission day. His white blood cell count was 18.46 thousand and hemoglobin was 15, uh, 15 grams per deciliter and platelets was 255 thousand. Serum creatinine and serum electrolytes were normal. His AST LT level is within the normal range but his CRP level was 15.7 mg per uh, liter. And later on in the e uh, day, in the evening, we did creatinine kinase level because patient was having recurrent spasm and it came as 1,349.6 units liter. Uh, so this is his uh, non contract CT brain, which was reported as normal. And on the same day of admission, he was uh, admitted to surgical ICU for further care. So what were the problems we had to face during his ICU stay? Uh, patient had very severe tetanus according to the ablates classification. Patient belonged to uh, very severe tetanus due to presence of autonomic instability. Patient showed poor response to tetanus immunoglobulin and recurrent tonic contractions uh, as su uh, subsequent as a result of uh, subsequent as a result of recurrent tonic contraction, patient developed rhabdomyolysis, autonomic instability, tetanus complicated with acute motor axonal neuropathy, septicemia with septic shock, which led to multi-organ failure with acute kidney injury, acute liver injury complicated with coagulopathy. He received ICV, ICU care for 22 days and tracheostomy done on day two of ICU stay.
on one of the major problems we faced during his uh, ICU stay was recurrent tonic spasms. So in this video, you can see the recurrent spasm patient was heavy and we managed this recurrent spasm with magnesium sulfate infusion, intravenous thiopentyl sodium, levotericitin, phenytoin, baclofen, and tysinic. Magnesium sulfate initially started in one in one, uh, five grams per hour infusion rate and later on during the third day of the ICU stay, it was stepped up to, up to 3.5 grams per hour infusion because patient was not responding to medical management. But on nine day of ICU stay, patient's patellar reflexes was ab absent and magnesium level was 4.33. The infusion rate was reduced to 0.5 gram per hour infusion. We also used intravenous phenytoin sodium 100 milligram thrice a day and baclofen 10 milligram thrice a day initially, which stepped up to 20 milligram twice a day later on as the sp uh, spasms were continuing. Intravenous vacuronium and propofol were also used as, a mu as muscle relaxants. We did first uh, encef uh, electroencephalogram done uh, uh, on uh, 8th of August 2021 fourth day of ICU care and reported as no evidence of encephalitis or encephalopathy, no seizure activity, bilateral occasional spikes were seen in frontal region. Second electroencephalogram was done on uh, uh, 10th of uh, August, 2021, day of ICU stay due to recurrent spasm and it was reported as focal discharge present more on left side. Third electroencephalogram done on 19th of August 2021, day 18 of ICU care. This was done to exclude autoimmune encephalitis, reported as severe form of encephalopathy, uh, probably due to sepsis. We sent anti glutamic acid decarboxylase antibody test to rule out stiff person syndrome, and it was 6.79 units, which was a negative report. Here, yeah. You can see his uh, MRI brain images, which was done on 11th day of ICU stay and they were normal. Our next problem was uh, during the management of this patient is autonomic instability. His blood pressure was persistent and fluctuating and needed ionotropic support. Initially, on admission, his blood pressure was stable and started to drop soon after intubation. It dropped down to 87 by 40 millimeter mercury and noradrenaline 0.2 microgram per kg per hour infusion was started. But on second day of admission, his blood pressure spiked up to 180 by 100 millimeter per mercury uh, and noradrenaline infusion was omitted. But he couldn't maintain his blood pressure more than a few hours and had to restart noradrenaline infusion and he was uh, he he continuously needed anotropic support over the course of his ICU stay. From the third day of ICU stay, patient developed continuous ongoing high fever spikes due to uh, sepsis and autonomic instability. This was managed with tapid sponging and cold saline infusion and cold bladder irrigation. Here you can see his temperature chart and you can see most of the time he was hypothermic showing more than 40 Celsius degrees Celsius temperature. But initially his procrastinate levels were normal. This patient developed rhabdomy uh, rhabdomyolysis due to recurrent spasms, tonic, tonic contraction and due to hypothermia. You can see in this uh, slide, that patient's creatinine kinase level uh, was gradually increased on eight day of illness, giving a result of 12,742.8. And he was treated with uh, forced alkaline diuresis and we achieved during pH of eight. And in addition to that, we hydrated the patient well and intravenous frismide was also given. Because patient developed areflexia on around day eight of illness, we did a nerve conduction study on him and report came as possible acute motor axonal neuropathy. Therefore, he was treated with IV immunoglobulin 28 gram for five days duration from 30th of August to 17th of August. 
Next, I would like to address septic shock and multi-organ failure. In this slide, you can see that the patient had multiple culture po positive results and become, um, they were multi-drug multi resistant. Blood culture came, as, came positive for acinetobacter on eight day of ICU care, and it was only sensitive for kefaparacin salbactam. And urine culture was positive for non-lactose fermenting coliform, and sputum culture was positive for lactose fermenting coliform, non-lactose fermenting coliform, and pseudomonas species. They were sensitive to amicacin and gentamicin. Central venous line culture was positive for acinetobacter, again sensitive only for kefaparacin calbacter, and central venous line tip was positive for lactose fermenting coliform and non-lactose fermenting coliform. So during his hospital stay, depending on the sensitivity pattern of culture reports, we treated him with different antibiotics accordingly. Initially, we started him on IV uh, IVC penicillin, 4 million units, six hourly with intravenous uh, metronidazole 500 milligrams, six hour dose regimen at ward. But after admitting the patient to surgical ICU, he was uh, started on IV keptraxone two gram uh, twice a day regime with IV metronidazole 500 milligram twice a day regime. Keptraxone was started because it has better coverage and I, I, intravenous C penicillin can aggravate spasms. Intravenous metronidazole was continued for total 10 days. And uh, according to the different culture reports, he was treated with IV uh, intravenous piperacin, tazobactam, 4.5 grams thrice a day, intravenous vancomycin, intravenous uh, 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 nebulization with gentamicin, and nebulization with cholestine. His lumbar puncture reports were negative for uh, meningoencephalitis uh, diagnosis. And even with the maximum support, he went into septic shock with multi-organ dysfunction with coagulopathy. He went into acute kidney injury with reduced urine output and rising creatinine, which was normal initially. Because of that, he was dialyzed once. He went into acute liver failure and coagulopathy. As you, you can see in this slide, his ASD levels was uh, going up to 7187 7, 1 and uh, ALT level was 266.3. After doing a rotational thromboembolometry, we uh, transfused him with red cell concentrates and blood products. And in this slide, you can see how his lungs were affected with ventilator associated pneumonia. This was taken on day eight of ICU stay. However, after all the effort, he took his last breath on 20, uh, August 23rd and probable cause of death was given as tetanus complicated with septicemia. Postmortem was anticipated and requested, but it was not performed as directed by hospital administration. I would like to invite Dr. Shehan Silva, sir, for the continuation of the session. Thank you very much, uh, Chanodhi, uh, for that excellent presentation uh, of a very rare uh, case. I mean, uh, these are rare for the younger generation, but then for all that who are in the audience, uh, the senior members, they have seen plenty of them uh, decades ago. So let me now invite uh, Dr. Uh, if, if H.D. Shehan Silva, the senior lecturer in medicine and non really consultant physician, University Medical Unit, Colombo South Teaching Hospital, Kalibo Villa, for the discussion of this case. Shehan, over to you. Thank you, Madam. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can see me uh, clearly. I hope my head is not chopped out. Uh, so uh, we'll be talking a little bit about tetanus uh, because this is something that is uh, very, very uh, rarely seen. That's why we said that this is a reminder of disease that is in oblivion. So uh, as we know from our theoretical knowledge, uh, tetanus is an infectious disease that is caused by Clostridium tetany or their spores, 
that is uh, it be because of contamination of wounds. And the etymology of this word comes from uh, Greek language where tetanos or tynine, which uh, means uh, rigidity or being stretched. And one needs to be, uh, be aware that this is the only vaccine preventable di disease that is infectious, but not contagious. So that's the reason that this, why this is very important. If you go to our history, we had many uh, warrior kings and we, we know of King Rajasinghe, the first of Sitaveka kingdom, who uh, came into the throne when he was in a tender age. And uh, we, we have heard of uh, this battle of Mullaria where uh, there was a great offensive uh, against the Portuguese. And uh, it says that the Mullaria uh, swamp was uh, uh, stained with blood. It, it became red color. And, we, and it's in, written in and also in Portuguese history as well as in colonial history. But unfortunately, this great King Raja Singh uh, succumbed to uh, uh, tetanus uh, while he was traveling in somewhere in uh, Kalutara. And they say that this was a plot. There are very con lot of controversies. Of course, the, the single word is unakira, right? Un unakatua. So uh, there have been uh, theories that this was uh, uh, a trap which was infested with fecal matter in, in, uh, in the tip of the uh, uh, poisoned dart. So this is where we learn of uh, tetanus in our history and the folklore says that he had a smile upon his face when he died. So we'll come to that. Why did he have a smile upon his face? So tetanus still, causes 48,000 to 80,000 deaths worldwide annually. And the true incidence is not known. Why? It is not a notifiable disease in most countries. Although we, we, not, we have it in our notifiable diseases list, it's not so in most of the Sub-Saharan Africa as well as the South America. And the case fatality rates in many source limited settings remain still high and unchanged. So you see our figures, we see that from 1980s where our seniors, our teachers, they, they would have seen multiple uh, cases of these in myriad forms. And you see in 1984, roughly 1984, when the EPI, the expanded uh, program for immunization came into activity, you see that steadily, uh, rapidly, the numbers have declined. And more so since I suppose 2017, we have hardly have had any cases of tetanus being this, uh, seen. Of course, from in pediatrician point of view, you see there, there are some eminent pediatricians in the panel, in, in the audience, uh, you see that, that disease uh, which tormented was neonatal tetanus, right? But we see again with, with, the, with the success of the UPI program that the numbers have come all more, most, uh, actually neonatal tetanus is uh, at null level. So Clostridium tetany is an anaerobe. It is a gram-positive uh, spore-forming rod, very, very fastidious, resilient, and survive in any kind of environment. And it is fastidious because it resists disinfection, boiling, and uh, it is able to survive because it has the capacity to make spores and remain dormant. And these uh, spores are seen in soil as well as in animal intestines, especially fecal carriage. And post inoculation, this with the, when the when the ideal environment is uh, uh, present, we'll talk about that. It transforms into a vegetative rod that produces toxins. So you see the classic description that we learned from our microbiology that it's a spore forming rod which has a terminal spore. Most of the description is likely that of a tennis racket, and you see that the spore forming uh, 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 contagion ch uh, changes into a vegetative form, the active form. So, however, there are only few uh, certain serovars that have the gene to produce the toxin. There are two toxins when you talk about tetanus, that I mean, the tetanospasmine, which is the more important metalloproteinase neurotoxin, which has such a ravaging effect on the central neurus, uh, nervous system. Of course, there is also another toxin called tetanolysin, which is uh, hemolysin, but the clinical relevance in humans is uncertain. 
but we need to know that tetanospasmine is one of the three most poisonous substances on weight basis. The other two are botulism and diphtheria. Pathogenesis wise, when these uh, vegetative drops uh, start to produce tetanospasmine, the tetanospasmine is uh, transported by a retrograde uh, axonal flow. That is, it goes from the nerve, uh, the, the endings, it goes up to the cell body as well as to the, up to the anterior horn of the spinal cord and it gives rise to uh, various problems. So what happens? It binds to gangliosides in the synapses and produces uh, an inhibitory effect uh, on the inhibitory neurotransmitters. So in the, in the, uh, in the synapses, there is a uh, regulatory mechanism where there are inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA and glycine, which actually uh, co controls the uh, activity of uh, the motor neurons. So when this inhibitory activity is uh, counteracted, there is continuous sim uh, stimulation of the excitatory neurotransmitters giving rise to signs. So tetany doesn't, as clostridium tetany does not grow in healthy tissues, but there, there should be a combination of factors. There's many a twix uh, between the cup and the lip. So just like that, what are they? There should be an absence of antibodies. Patients should not be primed, would not be primed. They are, they are, they are naive uh, from vaccination. Plus, they may be having these things. A penetrating deep in injury, which inoculates the spore deep down, causing uh, the uh, seeding of the bacteria to an uh, area where there is less oxygen, no oxygen, uh, and also the fact that when there is a co-infection of bacteria, other bacteria, which reduces the oxygen uh, 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 supply in that area. And when there is ischemia and this devitalized tissue, all these will uh, give rise to uh, tetany, tetanus pathogenesis. So I go on with this. So the commonly known ones are any kind of splinter, puncture wounds, gunshots, burns, especially burns. And also, uh, not so much in our country, we see that even with intravenous drug abuse, injection drug abuse, this tetanus could uh, be uh, manifest. The unusual ones, uh, although related to cultural practices, are in that what you get in neonates, where the umbilical stump can be infected uh, due to sterile ob uh, obstetric instruments, li like what we read up in gum perilia. And also in traditional application of cow dung, which is done mostly in India. Obstetric patients, they were because of septic abortion and illegal, uh, unconventional uh, practices, and also because of post-surgical patients where there is a normal uh, bowel fl flora uh, in a necrotic area. And also in genital mutilation, female genital mutilation and circumcision and also in certain immunocompromised patients like diabetics. So the vaccination, uh, so, sorry, the incubation period ranges from three to 21 days and usually it's about seven to eight days. But rarely, rarely you would see people developing tetanus in one day of exposure. So the time form uh, for injury to first symptom is taken as the incubation period. Uh, whereas there's a different entity called the period of onset, where the time from the first symptom to the development of reflex spasm is described. So more distal the injury site, the longer the incubation period is, as, as you can remember, it takes, it, it needs retrograde uh, transmission. And uh, incubation period is usually shorter in neonates than in non-neonatal tetanus. Diagnosis is, is based on clinical reasoning by clinical findings rather than any uh, lab, lab or uh, uh, any kind of radiological investigation. So uh, diag you can do diagnostic studies for academic purpose, but they are generally of little value because the culture can be negative in majority of the cases. 
And if you are uh, doing dealing a culture with it, you need to do it with that dega doing under anaerobic conditions after you uh, uh, inoculating on a uh, anaerobic uh, transport medium such as the Robertson Cook meat media. There's a test called the spatula test, which is a bedside test where the uh, tongue depressor or the spatula can be inserted into the pharynx. And the normal response, as you would know, would be a gag where the patient will try to expel the uh, spatula out. But in tetany, there is reflex spasm of the mass eaters that will lead into a strong bite of the spatula rather than putting it out. This is a highly sensitive and specific uh, test. However, there are no adverse sequelae reported. We, we did not do this test uh, in our patient. The patient was quite ill and of course, uh, we did not know about this test. There are various clinical shades of tetanus. The one that we know of is of generalized tetanus where there is bulba and paraspinal muscle involvement. Trismus is the reason for the common term for tetanus, which is called locked jaw, where there is difficulty in opening mouth because of mass eater involved. Another uh, manifestation is the rhesus sardonicus, where there is a grimace, a facial expression, uh, which is because of a spatial, facial spasm. We will see some pictures of this. The classic other uh, description is the opistotonus, which you saw in our patient. And they could have the other things like board like rigidity of the abdomen, dysphagia, etc. The, the important thing about tetanus is that patients are very, very uh, distressed and very, very ill, but there is no impairment of consciousness and the tonic contractions and spasms are painful. So this is a picture that you see, uh, which has been drawn by Sir Charles Bell, important person from medical history, a portrait of the dying soldier. You see that the demonstration of opistotonus, where there's extreme hyperextension and torticollis. Sardonic smile, as you see in this comic character, uh, the joke is, what is this? A sarcastic or mocking appearance. And these are some of the pictures that you would see in reality. of the tonus, the rhesus sardonicus, and this characteristic grimace of rhesus sardonicus. Other than the muscle involvement, there is autonomic dysfunction, which can give rise to activation of the adrenergic system. There can be sustained or labile hypertension. There can be hypotension. So it, just like guillain barr syndrome, there can be peripheral vasoconstriction, tachycardia, bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, and asystole, and profuse sweating, salivation, and uh, urinary retention. So the severity depends on the amount of toxin that is taken into the body, and, the, and also, uh, also the fact that uh, the clinical features may progress to more than uh, two weeks duration. So some usual, sometimes even it can go on to four to six duration. And most severe illness is seen in those who had deep penetrating wounds. And the, the effects of the toxin takes a longer time to uh, settle off because they, they, they need recovery of the growth of new axonal terminal. So you see that it's a prolonged agonizing illness. There is a classification called the ablet classification, which uh, grades one to four. Our patient had grade four, where it was very severe, which will include trismus, the muscle rigidity, the, the facial appearance, the opistotonus, and in the third stage, the muscle rigidity with uh, uh, reflexive spasm. But in our patient, there was autonomic dysfunction. There are other variants in this cephalic tetanus, which can come with uh, dental or middle ear infections, which has a poor prognosis. Again, as it can lead into generalized tetanus. Localized tetanus, again, can occur in a very uh, milder form where they could have weakness of muscles in the locality because of the local action at the neuromuscular junction. And they have a favorable prognosis. Maternal tetanus, thankfully, we have been able to read in our country. This occurs during pregnancy or within six weeks after conclusion of pregnancy. Maybe a birth, a miscarriage, an abortion, or a stillbirth. Neonatal tetanus is when there's a child who has the normal ability to suck and cry in the first two days or so of life. 
but losers thereafter after the third to 28th day becoming rigid and having spasm. Again, the, the length of the stump, the care, the cleanliness, and also the cultural factors, all of these will affect this. Very important, those who survive neonatal tetanus will go on to have learning difficulties uh, when they uh, grow. There was, there is, there was uh, uh, an initiative of uh, the WHO to target uh, elimination of neonatal tetanus in nine, by 1995, but this was extended another five years and so on and so forth, but still there, there is hardly any improvement. And now Sri Lanka, although we have reached this, uh, we have to maintain elimination by keeping the high coverage of immunization amidst negative attitudes. Differential diagnosis in, involves uh, things like uh, iatrogenic dystonias because of phenothiazine, psychiatric drugs. However, it differs uh, because there is uh, no eye deviation in tetanus. Certain dental infections or not give rise to Christmas, of course, the history will point out towards that. Strychnine, uh, rat poison, or Godakaturu or poison nut uh, poisoning can give rise to my Senior registrar will talk about that in more detail. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, there will be some drug involved, so neuroleptic uh, drug, and there will be muscle rigidity and autonomic instability, which is common, but uh, which will be common to tetanus and uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Altered mental status, and there will be a receipt of uh, the agent when it comes to uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Stiff person syndrome, again, we'll talk about that in the MCQs. So this is what we are talking about, strychnine a little bit, used, uh, this is godakaduru or the poison uh, nut, used to kill birds and small animals. And it is used uh, in uh, Ayurvedic and homeopathy as Nux formica. And this is a medical, uh, med uh, alternative medical property. So what are the principles of treatment? You have to halt toxin production, neutralize the unbound toxin, airway management, control muscle spasm, manage the dysautonomia, and generalize support, support of the patient. So how do you halt the pro toxin production? By doing wound management, wound debris more to evacuate the spores and necrotic tissue. This was done in our patient. So halting of the toxin, antimicrobials are universally recommended. But they may pl play a minor role unless there is deep seated, there is ex established uh, sepsis going on in that area. So, eradication of the bacteria needs debris more. And since it's an anaerobe, the drug of choice is metronidazole given in an intravenous fashion. Penicillin has been used uh, in, the, in, in the management, but penicillin has been shown to have a GABA antagonist property. Therefore, it worsens CNS excitability. Hence, this is the reason uh, why we changed penicillin the second day when we read, uh, read up on this. Of course, if there are mixed infections, then you go into uh, other antibiotics like third gen uh, cephalosporins and other drugs alternatives are also possible. The unbound toxin can be neutralized by giving the human tetanus immunoglobulin. We gave uh, uh, a higher dose, like uh, I remember 5,000 units. This, this was uh, what we found in literature, but then we found out that the, U, the CDC of the USA recommends even a dose of 500. I think that this is quite uh, useful in a low resource setting as of ours if we come across uh, patients with tetanus. And the, uh, there are randomized control trials which have been done, which have shown that uh, it is very uh, effective. There have been uh, RCTs done, which have showed that, uh, we, which have looked at the possibility of intrathecal administration, but uh, it is very controversial uh, because it didn't show any change in mortality, although the duration of the spasm and the hospital stay was reduced. Other alternatives when you don't have the specific antitoxin is to give the equine antitoxin, uh, which causes hypersensitivity reaction, or 
one can give the human immunoglobulin as an alternative. Patients who are having a tetanus uh, need to be actively immunized with tetanus toxide because it does not carry immunity following the infection. This is very essential to know. Muscle spasms can give rise to respiratory failure, aspiration, and induce uh, generalized exhaustion. So you need to uh, manage such a patient in an environment where there's less noise, uh, comfortable temperature, and agents such as benzodiazepines can be used for sedation. Diazepam, when one uses it, needs to be careful because it can cause lactic acid uh, as well as uh, high, an uh, uh, acidosis uh, uh, because of this propylene glycoline. Midazolam does not have uh, propylene glycol, so it is uh, favored. Other agents that can be used are like things like propofol, and also there is a place for vecuronium, which was used in our patient. Baclofen is also a drug that can be used because it can uh, stimulate the postsynaptic GABA beta receptors. Uh, we gave uh, oral uh, baclofen, uh, but they are, it can be given intrathecally. I don't think it's available in our country. So autonomic dysfunction is ma managed uh, by using magnesium sulfate, which we used in our patients. It, it is a presynaptic neuromuscular blocker. It blocks the catecholamine release and reduce the responsiveness uh, of uh, the adrenergic substances. And it has shown to reduce the requirement for antispasmodics. -spasm beta blockers, which have uh, alpha and beta effects like labitalol can be also used. General nursing care involves reducing external stimulation, which we spoke of. The airway protection, which we did for our patient it, by intubation, and then we uh, performed a tracheostomy. Hydration and nutrition need to be maintained because they have increased core temperature and energy requirements. Therefore, uh, you need to uh, be wary of this, control the fever, and, and also uh, other things of uh, managing a person who is bed bound and in ICU. So sequelae in, involves like laryngo, going into laryngospasms, they could have se severe spasms going into fractures, rhabdomyolysis, and uh, patients could have uh, developed a ventilator associated pneumonia like in our patient. And uh, they can also go into hypoxia by asphyxia because of the neck, uh, the pharyngeal muscle involvement. So death is caused by three modes. The majority of them are by asphyxiation, uh, by muscle spasm. Metabolic derangements also can come into play like dehydration, hypoglycemia, low sodium and low calcium, and also secondary sepsis giving to super infections. The essential that uh, as medical officers, we need to know that all deaths with uh, tetanus needs to undergo an inquest. It is not a legal requirement, but it is, it is stipulated by a circular, ministry circular, and it is in the hospital manual as well. The, of course, the Code of Criminal Procedures of our country states that whatever injury that is caused by an animal or a machinery uh, needs to have an inquest and a post-mortem, and hence maybe the precedence for this statement where a death following tetanus needs to have an inquest. So certainly uh, an inquest needs to be uh, uh, performed rather than just giving a certi uh, certificate cause of death, but a, uh, a probable cause of death going into a uh, inqu inquest. So I will hand over the session, long session, which I spoke of. Uh, now this part on prevention which will be uh, addressed in the MCQs, but there will be other areas as well. I invite uh, Dr. Philip to take the reins. Thank you so much. Could I invite you at the third speaker? Uh. Yeah. Thank you, Shehan. Thank you very much.
the uh, it should be now the MCQ discussion by Dr. J. Philip and and Helen. So let me invite Dr. Philip and Helen to do the MCQ. Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Madam. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank Sri Lankan Medical uh, College, uh, Medical Association for this uh, for giving this valuable opportunity. For the remaining twenty minutes, uh, my role is to discuss mul uh, several multiple choice questions regarding the case, which has we have seen earlier. So we all know the tetanus is only preventable by the vaccination. So that was, I want to start uh, from the questions from the tetanus vaccines. The first one, uh, the tetanus can be controlled by herd immunity. And the second, the patients with burn have high risk of tetanus. Severe reactions to the tetanus vaccine indicate a high pre-existing antitoxins level. The fourth one is the vaccine is contraindicated in immunosuppressed. And the final one can be it can be given to someone with acute infection. And uh, before going to the MCQ analysis, let me explain the tet regarding the tetanus vaccine. So the tetanus it cannot be eradicated because uh, the spores are all around, and uh, the protective immunity is not acquired following an infection. So the only way we are getting the immunity. Uh, by active or passive immunization. Uh, if we speak about the active immunization, that is tetanus vaccine, in case of tetanus infection, uh, that is, uh, we, are, we are getting the passive immunization that is through the uh, tetanus specific immunoglobin. So the catching tetanus does not make you immune. Uh, this word has been popular during the World War time, World War II time. And uh, this, this is the basis they have uh, won the tetanus during the wartime. So the first inactivated tetanus vaccine was discovered in 1924. Having said that, uh, the first uh, juiceable tetanus vaccine, it has been introduced in form of DTP that containing diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus in 1948. And uh, it has later replaced with acellular pertussis because of these uh, higher reaction side effect to DTAP. If we see the efficacy of the vaccine uh, compared to the diphtheria and pertussis, we can observe the 100% efficacy of tetanus vaccine. So this is the chart, uh, which has been epidemiology unit from uh, it's, it's the epidemiology of uh, tetanus. It has been published in 2020 by the WHO. If we see, see the highlighted area if you see in 1980s uh, it, it, the cases of the total tetanus is more than thousand and it has dramatically improved in around 1990s that all because of this uh, expanded program of immunization as earlier discussed you can clearly see the dramatical improvement improvement after the 90s that uh, earlier as uh, mentioned the api a program has been started in 1974 and within four years in Sri Lanka also implement that and uh, followed that there's a dramatical improvement of uh, total tetanus case has been reduced and having said that after the two after 2019 there was no single case of neonatal tetanus has been observed in Sri Lanka. So this is the way the multiple modalities of tetanus vaccine. And earlier it has uh, introduced a like uh, containing of whole cell pertussis, diphtheria and tetanus as DTWP. Later it has modified and DT, DTAP that containing the acellular pertussis. The common usable tetanus vaccine uh, nowadays in the national immunization program is pentavalent that containing DTP, hepatitis B and HIP. And other than that, there's a hexavalent also available in Sri Lanka in the outside uh, that's containing in addition to the pentavalent, it's containing the inactivated polio virus. 
Having said that, there are other modality of tetanus stock type vaccines also available. That is only tetanus uh, containing vaccines and, uh, and combination of tetanus and diphtheria vaccines as well. So if we see the indication for the vaccination, that means active immunization, there are only three uh, modalities like one is the rotten immunization, which we are following in the national immunization program. The second one, immunization following an injury. And third one, after the tetanus infection. Uh, let me explain the rotten, uh, rotten immunology, uh, sorry, immunization in childhood. Usually there are six doses usually given to the child uh, immunization program. The first pentavalent that is in the second, fourth and sixth month and DTP around in uh, 18 months, followed by uh, diphtheria and tetanus in five years and adult tetanus and diphtheria in the 11 years. If a person who is not remembering the immunization or he has missed the childhood immunization, so is, uh, it is advisable to get five doses of tetanus toxide, uh, like uh, first dose followed by after the four weeks, he has to take second dose and the third dose has to be given six months after the second dose and fourth dose after the one to five years after the third dose and followed by uh, fifth dose. Uh, it has to be taken within one to 10 years after the fourth dose. So after all this, usually after these all immunization, usually patient is uh, the person is having full booster for the tetanus Having said that after the 10 years, it is not much proven as because we are not having any trial evidence of antibody levels uh, in worldwide. So what they, are what they are mentioning is after the 10 years, if you are getting a very bad wound, which containing uh, which is suspicious to get a tetanus. So it is recommended to give an additional booster dose, even though if you have taken full immunization of tetanus in the past. So this is the immunization schedule for the pregnant woman. Uh, if the pregnant lady, if the pregnant mother came after full immunization, it is advisable to get a first dose of tetanus toxide after the 16 weeks of gestation and followed by second dose for the first pregnancy is recommended after six to eight weeks. And during the second pregnancy is on second and third and fourth pregnancies only one immunization tetanus toxide is enough. That is after 12 weeks of gestation. So uh, then we'll move to the questions. The first question is tetanus can be controlled by herd immunity. Again, is obviously false. As we all know, it cannot pass from person to person. And therefore it cannot be prevented by herd immunity. The word herd immunity, we are now much familiar after the COVID pandemic. We all know the several countries, they have tried the herd immunity in highly spreadable disease such COVID and it has almost failed. And uh, comparing that, if the tetanus is, there is no transmission from person to person. So there is no immunization after the active infection. So herd immunity is impossible in case of tetanus. Second one is patient burns are at high risk for tetanus. So it's obvious, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the spores of tetanus are all around the environment, including our skin and intestinal tract. So if we, uh, the, what happened in the burn is uh, we are losing our barriers. So it, it is the first reason to tetanus go inside our body. And having said that, there are some other traditional practices has been documented in the literature and uh, that including applications of several uh, preparation from the leaves, and it has postulated increase uh, the prevalence of the tetanus in burn patients. The third one is severe reaction to the tetanus vaccine indicate high pre-existing antitoxin level. Obviously, it's not only for the tetanus, it's for all the vaccination. If you have a high level of antibody level, definitely the most reactions will occur. It may be localized, sometimes it may be systemic. So the fourth one is vaccination is contraindicated in immunosuppressed. Again, it's false, it's not true. And it's not contraindicated. Actually, we have to give additional booster dose for the vaccine. So if we see the vaccine of the tetanus, it's the toxoid. It has been extracted from the strains of uh, tetanus. And later it has been 
uh, inactivated uh, with the formaldehyde. And uh, then, uh, then after it has been formulated with multiple uh, aluminum hydroxides component. So it, it is a, not a live vaccine. So definitely any immunosuppressed person, they can get the vaccination. The fifth one uh, can be given to someone with an acute infection. That is also common for all the immunization. Any acute illness is contraindication for the vaccination. So we will quickly see the other stems regarding the tetanus. It is a gram-positive anaerobic non-capsulated bacillus. Uh, we have uh, seen this uh, sentence from the lecture. Uh, tetanus spores are present in the intestinal tract of the human. And third one is tetanus can be transmissible from human to human. The fourth one is the time from inoculation with tetanus spores to the first symptom can occur within 48 hours. The muscle spasm that occur in the tetanus are painful. So uh, let me explain the first one. It's an easy one. The gram, it is a gram positive anaerobic non-capsulated bacillus. Obviously, it is obligate anaerobic non-capsulated. It's a motile and gram positive bacillus. As early explained, the spores, what we are seeing in the end of the stick is the spores. They are very resistant to heat and disinfectant, what we are using in our usual practice. The tetanus spores are present in the intestinal tract of the human. Obviously, it can be all around the environment. It can be anywhere from the soil, ashes, or intestinal tract, or any feces of the animals or human, or it can be anywhere from the nails or needles, etc. The third one, tetanus can be trans transmissible from human to human. So as I earlier uh, mentioned, it cannot be transmissible to human to human. Uh, usually they need an uh, anaerobic uh, environment to grow up. So other thing I want to highlight here is the infection by the Colostridium tetani result in a benign appearance at the port of entry because it can't produce the inflammatory reaction around the wound. So unless uh, they are associated co-infection around that entry uh, port. So this is uh, the reason most of the cases has been missed or it has been not take uh, medical attentions by the patients. The time from uh, inoculation with the tetanus post to the first symptoms can occur within 48 hours. Anyway, uh, it's a tricky question. Let me explain. As usually in generalized tetanus, the incubation period is three to 21 days. And in case of neonatal tetanus, it's around three to 10 days, having said that it can come after 48 hours as well. The last form, the cephalic tetanus, and uh, it is a very uh, dangerous one, and it can change later in the generalized form as well. In this case, usually they are having the uh, features early, very early, like 24 to 48 hours, they may get symptoms. Okay. The muscle spasm that occur in the tetanus are painful, again, is true. The patient with generalized tetanus, they are characteristically having the tonic contraction of the skeletal muscles, and in between, they are getting the intermittent intense muscular spasm. They all are very painful. So let me move on to the strychnine poisoning. Uh, the first question, the toxin is found in the seed of strychnine, strychnox nox vomica. The toxin produced by the tetanus is similar to the strychnine poisoning. The third one, the muscle spasm caused by the strychnine is called as awake schizes. The fourth one, the spasm produced by the strychnine can be clinically differentiated from the tetanus spasm. The last one is usually the poisoning causing early altered mental status. So if you see the toxin, it's found in the seed of the uh, strychnox nox vomica. It's again true, it has uh, explained earlier. It's the alkaloid toxin. It's found in the seeds of the strychnox nox vomica. And initially it was introduced as a rodent site and later it has been used in the uh, medical practice as a stimulant for the respiratory and circulatory and digestive system. And later it has been, uh, we told, nowadays we are not using that in a pharmacological practice. And uh, now it is found in the street drugs such as heroin and crack cocaine. The second question is toxin produced by the tetanus similar to the strychnine, as explained earlier, is again same. The strychnine poison is the true mimic of tetanus. And the both poisonings, they have the inhibitory muscles activity 
that is that is the reason for getting these painful spasms. The third one, the muscle spasm caused by the stretching is called as the wake season. Again, it's true. The patient uh, presented with episodic muscles contraction after intake of this uh, stretchion, and uh, usually they are getting the symptoms within half an hour, and never ever patients, until the late stage, the patient's mental status is normal. Having said that, they may getting frequent attack of Jesus, that is called as the wake Jesus. The spasm produced by stretchion can be clinically differentiated from the tetanus spasm. So if, we, if you see the chart, yeah, uh, again, the differentiation, we have to start from the history and the examination and from the analysis pharmacology uh, so investigation. So again, if you see the history, uh, definitely there should be a poisoning history or drug intake should be there in case of stretchion. Having said that tetanus, usually the injury should be present, but having said 25% of the tetanus cases in the worldwide, they, there is no uh, amount of entry. So the onset of symptoms, if you see the stretchion poisoning, usually symptom will start within 20 minutes or 30 minutes, but not in case of tetanus, it's a gradually onset of symptoms. It may take one or two days and it progressively worsen the latter part. And uh, if you see the stretchion poisoning, we can't, even though patient is developing uh, much spasm, the locked jaw, the trismus has been not much observed. And relaxation between the spasm, if you see the relaxation between the spasm, patient with stretchions, they are completely normal in between the uh, fits episode or spas spastic episode, uh, not in case of tetanus, because they are having persistent uh, rigid and in between they are developing painful spasm. They are never ever relaxed. So fatal period is with few hours or days uh, within one day and tetanus, again, it can, according to the severity of the tetanus, it may prolong. So chemical analysis, uh, toxicology analysis, we can found the stretching and tetanus can't. So the fifth, final uh, fifth question regarding the stretching, usually the poisoning causing early altered mental status. Again, as I has mentioned earlier, it's under the late stage, it will never cause altered mental status. So this is the last question. Uh, this is other one of the differential diagnoses in our case. So I want to uh, discuss uh, at least five stems regarding the stiff person syndrome. Uh, first is, uh, there is muscle stiffness and spasm affecting the limbs, back and spine, but not jaw. The second one, there may be a hyperlordosis of the spine during the attacks. Third one is stiffness persists during sleep. And the fourth one, stiff person syndrome can be associated with autoimmune disorder. And the final question is, and anti get antibodies are usually positive in paraneoplastic stiff person syndrome. So if you see the first question, there is a muscle stiffness and spasm affecting the limbs, back and spine, but not jaw. We should know uh, in case of tetanus, usually most of the time they are having, in, in case of uh, cephalic tetanus, except in the local tetanus, unless they uh, enroll into the generalized tetanus, usually in other cases, we can observe the trismus, but not in the case of stiff person syndrome. Uh, usually they are not having the trismus. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the same mechanism is going here as well. It is caused by increased muscle activity due to the decreased inhibition of CNS. Here, the blockage due to the GET antibody, that is glutamic acid decarboxylase, it is an enzyme critical for maintaining the inhibitory pathway. So the word, the fact is absence of trismus or facial spasm and the rapid response to benzodiazepine that are characteristic of stiff person syndrome help to distinguish stiff person syndrome from the true tetanospasm. So if, if you uh, analyze in our case, here there we have suffered a lot to control the spasm with benzodiazepine and tisanidine and uh, with max, uh, high dose of magnesium sulfate as well. Uh, in case of uh, stiff person syndrome, definitely they will respond to the benzodiazepine. Okay. The second question, there may be hyperlordosis of the spine during the attacks, obviously it's true. And then because of the persistent contraction and uh, opposing parasternal muscles group, 
uh, forming this hyperlordosis. Not only the during the attacks are followed by also patients may have this posture. And the third one, stiffness persists during the sleep. That's false. And uh, the explanation to this question, usually the stiffness and spasms, they are disappearing during the sleep and during the anesthesia. Uh, that is because of uh, reduced inhibition of uh, GABA activity. So that causing reduced stiffness in this case. The stiffness is, we know the pathology stiffness is because of the loss of control of the descending brainstem or segmental spinal inhibitory influence on the lower motor neurons. So fourth one, stiff person syndrome can be associated with autoimmune disorders against true. We all know the type one diabetic and stiff person syndromes are uh, having the same antibody and they get antibodies. So it's well documented, the stiff person syndrome have a high association with the autoimmune disorder. The final question, the anti-get antibodies are usually positive in paraneoplastic stiff person syndrome. So uh, this is usually, the question is uh, false because usually in case of uh, stiff person syndrome is associated with anti-get antibody. Again, if we see the case reports and literature survey, the paraneoplastic stiff person syndromes, only 5% of anti-get antibodies are positive. And uh, the antibody, what we are, going to search in para stiff person syndrome is anti amphetamine antibody. There are other antibodies also available. Uh, that's all about uh, the MCQ session. Thank you. Thank you very much for the whole team uh, of uh, uh, speakers. Uh, I'm just wondering whether there are any questions. Uh, the, uh, I'm sure that uh, the Professor Narada Varna Surya is there in the audience. I do not know whether he could talk to his uh, uh, practical experience on neonatal tetanus. Uh, I mean, you may have seen plenty of cases. Hello. Can you he hear not me? There, He's not there now, no? Right, so yeah. the, actually the tetanus was not anything rare. Uh, I mean, say um, when I was a student, yeah, every time there was a single case uh, in surgical wards, patient was covered with screens and we were not supposed to disturb the patients. But then uh, from the time that I became a registrar, uh, I mean, it became a, so much of a rarity and now it has become so much rare and uh, you hardly get any, op any opportunity to see a tetanus patient. So that's why the uh, Dr. Uh, Shehan Silva and his team took an interest to show you this case, because in case that if you come across a patient, then it, uh, uh, that would be an opportunity for you to diagnose. And it's important that we revise the management because it's not totally eradicated. So the, uh, uh, I think that you uh, three together made an excellent pres presentation uh, of the case scenario and uh, 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 in detail uh, discussion, as well as the other in MCQs in relation to differential diagnosis. So uh, let me thank, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me thank the whole team from uh, College of Physicians for this excellent presentation and for educating all uh, uh, attendees uh, on uh, tetanus and its other associations and complications. Thank you very much, Shehan. Thank you very much, uh, Chanurdi. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for joining. And we will see that you receive the uh, certificates from the Sri Lanka Medical Association in the course. Thank you for your contribution. And for thank audience, you, thank you for joining and for your patient attention. And uh, thank you, stay safe. Thank you.